Hello, BookTube. After the, a very peaceful early morning walk with the bean, once she was finally ready to go on an early morning walk, of course, I spent my first four hours of the day waiting for her to first wake up and then stretch herself into feeling like she wanted to go out and confront the world. My little girl is not a morning person, but it doesn't matter anyway. I've spent, conservatively speaking, 40% of my entire life waiting for people to wake up. <laughs> so once we were done with that, we had a beautiful peaceful early morning walk and then when when we were back here and I'd, I'd fed her and you know settled her down and whatnot I realized that it had been ages since I paid a visit to the Brattle bookshop here in Boston a used bookstore downtown in Boston that is uh, wonderful just wonderful crammed full of new books on every subject in the world except for romance and constantly being renewed they're out buying all the time. So it's not like uh, some used bookstores that I have known, some used bookstores have been my neighborhood used bookstore, where stock really doesn't change all that much. Every once in a while, it's a big deal. You notice right away when the owner has bought a box of books, and it's one box of books. The Brattle will go out and routinely get 100 boxes of books at a time. Uh, and in addition to that, they have a sale lot outdoor. It was a fine, beautiful morning. It's clouded over since then. There's a massive, massive storm system, uh, weather system, covering, just stretching almost the whole width of the United States and headed east, headed this way, so that the weather forecast apps are predicting a significant chance of rain here in Boston for the next four days straight. I don't know if that'll happen, but uh, we're definitely getting the trailing edges of that now. And But we weren't this morning. First thing this morning was absolutely beautiful, and the Brattle sale lot is uh, is open to the elements. They are they wheel the carts out and opened up the side the side walls of the lot every single morning, and that's thousands more books. Also, prone to enormous overturn and one dollar, three dollars, and five dollars. So easy to fill your arms with books. And I knew that that forecast was coming. I knew that there's a chance that it will rain, maybe even rain for four days. But there's no use. There's no going to the Brattle sale lot in the rain. The carts are covered over. Uh, so I went. <laughs> it had been so long. But I, I went to see what I could find. And I found a lot. I found a gigantic pile of books that I want to show you. We will start with uh, mass market paperbacks. I found a lot of mass market paperbacks. Of course, I've mentioned you many times before. Mass market paperbacks are the normal size, not those taller uh, airport books. But the ordinary, traditional mass market paperbacks are not made anymore. Which means there's a finite number of them. They're not constantly being remade. Which means that if you find, I don't even want to call them vintage, but if you find old science fiction or Western or mystery or old mass market paperbacks of any kind, it stands to reason just mathematically that the more you shop in used bookstores, the fewer of them you will see. Granted, some of them are in catch piles in big hordes that haven't broken open into the public, but the Brattle is routinely finding those hordes. So... I I used to love mass market paperbacks for a long, long time. They were the only kind, the only size of book that I that I had was mass markets. Didn't I scorned trade paperbacks, which weren't all that common, and also hardcovers. It's just being huge and unwieldy. Of course, now I view all print and paper books as huge and unwieldy because of ebooks. But when I find mass market paperbacks, especially if I don't think I'm ever going to see them as an ebook, I grab them. And I am guided by BookTube when that happens. A lot of times I am guided by BookTube. Because BookTube has big events. Reading events big and small. Uh, and that always intrigues me. I'm always on the lookout for fodder for those events. Like, for instance, uh, in August, there's Garb August. Ollie at Criminali has made a, an instant BookTube success with his now years-old uh, event called Garb August, where in, gar in August, at the dog days of summer here in the Northern Hemisphere, we read garbage. We read trash. <laughs> and uh, I found a science fiction novel that I'm suspecting is trash. I might, be, I might be wrong, but I doubt it. It's by Stephen Lee, and it's called Dr. Bones, The Secret of Lona. Uh, I don't know if that's Lona behind him. He seems singularly unconcerned. Uh, beyond Indiana Jones, beyond Doctor Who, incredible the incredible adventurer whose exploits span the stars. 
Uh, okay, his name is Dr. Bones. His adventures will take him across a perilous galaxy in search of lost cities, secret empires, and vanished species. And sometimes into the exploits when his background makes him the best man for the job. This looks like trash to me. <laughs> I could be wrong. It could be really good. It's wrong in one way, at least. There is no beyond Doctor Who. Okay, <laughs> there is no beyond the Doctor. But I, I understand what the, what the writer on the cover was going for, so we'll see. Uh, it's, it looks like it's 1980s. Uh, am I right about that? Yeah, 1988. So too late for Rocket Summer, another booktube event, a booktube event in July. Uh, but definitely a candidate for Garbox. And then another uh, booktube event is going on right now, and that is March Mystery Madness. Of course, I read mysteries voraciously all year long anyway. I don't, I don't just leave them for March. But I found yet another mystery. This one's in a little bit of, of uh, rough shape. I'll have, to, I'll have to shore this up just a bit. Uh, from an author I have never enjoyed, and you would think if that's true, I wouldn't buy the author anymore, but for a dollar, uh, I was willing to give it a try. The author is Freeman Wills Croft, and he came up in uh, this book, uh, The Bedside Companion to Crime, where this author, H.R.F. Keating, uh, talks about his, uh, uh, Freeman Wills Croft's Inspector French mysteries and calls them repeatedly, repeatedly calls them boring and dry more mathematical problems than they are human dramas. And I I guess maybe I had never known that Keating did that or that any other mystery author has done that because I've encountered Croft many times. And every time I find him a book of his for a dollar or 50 cents, I read it and always have the same reaction, that that was absolutely sapped of life. But Croft had a big career. He was extremely popular. So I keep thinking there might be something I'm missing. Now I know that maybe that maybe not. There's not anything I'm missing, because Keating knew in his lifetime a lot more about murder mysteries than I do. And he also found this author, Donald, but I found this old this old popular library of uh, Tragedy in the Hollow. A little bit of a divot there out of the cover, so I will, uh, I will fix that and maybe reinforce the spine while I'm at it. But this is, this is another Inspector French mystery. I don't expect it to thrill me. Uh... Son of a British Army officer, Freeman Willscroft was born in Dublin and educated at a Methodist and Campbell Colleges in Belfast. Okay. Well, so on the one hand, uh, okay, so on the one hand, he was born in Dublin, uh, which means he shouldn't be able to tell a boring story. But he was the son of a British officer and he was raised Protestant, so maybe those things have something to do with it. I don't know if this, it would be too much to hope. That this is number nine in the in the Inspector French mystery series. That would be too much to hope for. I will check it out, but I will read it anyway. Uh, and then we have uh, another booktube event, June on the Range, coming up in June, a celebrate Michael K. Vaughn's celebration of all things Western. I have a whole bunch of Westerns that I have just been buying since last June on the Range. I like Western novels. In fact, I like them a lot more since I started participating in June on the Range than I did before. Uh, where I'd only read, you know, the big ones or the really popular ones, but not really anything else. Certainly not made any kind of a serious study of the genre until June on the Range, where I have done that. But I don't love Westerns enough to pick at them all year long. Murder mysteries I can't do without. And actually science fiction I can't do without. Maybe or maybe I could do without Dr. Bones. But I, can certainly, I can't do without science fiction all year long. Uh, but Westerns? Yeah. I've been buying them since last June on the range, just throwing them on a pile. I've got a great big pile now. I think I'm right about ready to stop, even if they're a dollar. I found three of them uh, this morning for a dollar each. One is uh, a book in a series. A lot of Western series, a lot of Western novels come in series. This is the latest adventure of a character named Jim Steele. This one is called Gold Train. It's Jim Steele. Number five, written by an author who I absolutely refer, refuse to believe is actually named Jez Cody. That is certainly a pen name. Uh, but I don't think, I've, I'm pretty sure that I've never read, uh, uh, what's his name again? Jim Steele Adventure. When Steele saved a young woman's life and foiled a train robbery by filling two cold-hearted customers with hot lead, he thought he'd be a hero. Instead, the woman screamed rape and Steele was suddenly the leading suspect in the bungled hold-up attempt. 
okay. Um, all right. Well, they're, they're hanging from the outside of a train, so things have probably gone horrible. Uh, that was one uh, Western I found. Then I found another one. This is by William Cox. I don't think I've read this author. There's so many Western authors out there. Oh, my God. Just because Westerns are dead now. Once upon a time, they were not only alive, but the most popular kind of book. And this is Moon of Cobre. The murder of a girl turns a peaceful town into a gun-crazed hell. And once again, we have this original artwork. Maybe not so much this. Uh, but we have original artwork here that is just, that is just lovely. Uh, what have we got here? Matt Buxton was a good man who built an empire out of prairie dust. But Mac Buxton was loyal to his own, even to his rowdy brother Jed, who fought too often and drank too much. He was so loyal that when Jed shot a girl in the back, he was willing to wreck his own town and start a range war to save Jed's hell-bent neck from the rope. What he didn't count on was Marshall Hancock, the lawman who believed in law, the girl and the girl's mother, just arrived from East, who'd do anything for revenge. That sounds really good, so I will certainly do that. Uh, then I found a piece of mass market nonfiction, uh, a UK paperback uh, by John Harris. Uh, this is called Without Trace, and it's about famous last voyages. Eight famous last voyages. So we have uh, the Franklin Arctic Expedition, which is the the, uh, the basis of The Terror by Dan Simmons, a tremendously effective book. We have the Marie Celeste. Uh, we have the USS Maine, blown sky high in Havana Harbor. Well, I don't think that's, you know, exactly, well, that's, it's a last voyage, definitely. It's just not anything mysterious about it. The liner Warata vanished off Cape Horn without a stick of wreckage. The fate of the USS Cyclops, lost during the First World War. The Joyita, waterlogged and off course, crew and cargo missing. And the Tainmouth Electron, winner apparent of the, war, of the round the world yacht race, sighted deserted and drifting. <sighs> Naval lore. I'm not ever going to need much to push me to naval lore. Then I found some uh, science fiction. This might be Garbogus, but I think the author's a little bit too big a name. Uh, when I, I'm i more convinced than ever this year that when I do Garbogus in 2024, I am going to try hard not to pick any fights. I'm going to pick authors that are clearly garbage and stick to that rather than, you know, a month of Cormac McCarthy or something like that. And this is a science fiction author, Ben Bova, who has never done anything much for me. Uh, but I found one of his from the 1980s. This is Test of Fire with, once again, a Howard Chaikin cover. No small thing. You have a, an A-list science fiction author here and a great artist for the cover. Uh, and this is this is from the 1980s, but it's about the millennia. It's about the, the millennium. Cities become ovens, grasslands become seas of flame. As the touch of dawn swept westward across the spinning planet Earth, its fiery finger killed everything in its path. Glaciers in Switzerland began to melt. Floodwaters poured down on the burning, smoking villages dotting the Alpine meadows. Paris became a torch, then London. North of the Arctic Circle, Laplanders in their summer furs burst into flame as their reindeer collapsed. <laughs> the line of dawn raced westward across the Atlantic Ocean, but as it did, the brightness diminished. The sun dimmed as quickly as it had brightened. The Americas escaped the sun's wrath. Almost. So, when the sun flared, the night-shielded New World almost escaped destruction. But as their sky began burning, who could blame the Russians for thinking that the Americans had attacked? Uh, so, it'll be a dastardly weapon. I don't think I ever read this in the 80s when it came out. It'll be a dastardly weapon when we get to the end of it. And in the 80s, 40 years ago, neither Ben Bover nor anyone else thought we would be living in that reality. We would be living in a superheated world. I... Uh, I'm sure that if you'd asked Ben Bova when he was writing this book, he'd have said, well, weather patterns change all the time. We get a really hot summer, then a really mild summer, but they, they're, they're not, it's not anything predictable, and it's not the end of the world. And if you had told him, well, you're not going to make it, but if you waited 40 years, there would come a time when 2020, the year 2020, is the hottest year on record, and the hottest year in, paleo, in paleo, Paleolithic record, ice core samples for this period. And then 2021 was hotter than that. And then 2022 was hotter than that, also set a world record. And then 2023 was also a world record setter. And then, and so on and so forth. Uh, now it, it's it's going to read a little different. It's not going to be eco-terror at all. It's going to be a super weapon, I'm sure. 
Uh, then we have uh, Ham and Inns. I've never seen this copy, this book before. It's in beautiful condition. Even though it must have come out, again, 40 years ago. Oh, more than that, 50 years ago, 1971. This is the Levkus Man. In this, once upon a time, in the, in the mid-70s, and then a little bit into the 80s, you had this book cover design. I miss it. I really like it. it. It prized lots and lots of open space. Lots and lots of white. You would have an illustration, but it would be intentionally cameoed small on the cover. And this is uh, Hammond Innes's one of his shticks as a writer is that he, he often just skips having a hero. Instead, he will put a normal person in the vise of his plot. I, he found that more entertaining to write. Uh, let's see here. Uh, wow, this is blurbs from Orville Prescott, whose name you will not know, and V.S. Pritchett, whose name you might know. And they're both singing his praises, just singing him to the skies. Uh, now brings his storytelling genius to a novel of enormous excitement, the search for a lost archaeologist in Greece and for the beginnings of man's violent nature in the dawn of history. Hence the cave painting on the cover there. Well, I, I've never been disappointed by Ham and Inn, so I would definitely give it a try. Oh, okay, all right. Uh, these next six novels, the, I believe I'm missing only one now in this set. I found almost the whole set of this. Uh, no offense at all to one of the co-authors, an Iowa boy who I have nothing but affection for. Uh, but I am definitely going to be reading these for Garbogus. <laughs> no, no offense to either author involved at all. <laughs> this is Red Sonia. <laughs> this is number one, The Ring of Ikibu. Uh, and there you have a Boris Vallejo cover, just lovely, lovely cover. These came out in the 1980s. I believe these were just uh, uh, cash and carry things. Uh, 19, uh, 1981. And the copyright is Glenn Lord, and you Conan fans will be able to tell me why. <laughs> this is, uh, uh, the, it, I don't know David Smith from Adam, uh, but Richard Tierney was, was the real deal, an unbelievable Conan fan, an even bigger H.P. Lovecraft fan. Richard Tierney was Michael K. Vaughn before Michael K. Vaughn was born. He knew everything about the mythos, did a lot of evangelizing on the subject of, of, uh, great pulp horror and pulp horror fantasy, getting it into people's hands, making sure that they gave it a second try, making sure that they liked it. Uh, and he did a lot of Conan writing, continuing Conan stories, fleshing out or finishing Conan stories. And he did these. These are pastiche novels uh, that aren't actually Conan pastiche novels. Not really. They're not really Robert E. Howard pastiche novels because that character is from the comic books. That character never appears in Robert E. Howard. It's the name of one Robert E. Howard character, not spelled that way, but close enough, spelled with a Y, and the attitudes and the swordsmanship of another Robert E. Howard character, two female characters drawn from two different stories uh, that don't have much dramatic potential on their own. The Marvel Comics writer Roy Thomas melded those things together and created a character in the Hyborian Age, a contemporary and friend of Conan, called Red Sonja, who is big and red-haired and has an unbelievable skill with a sword that is enhanced by the fact that she was granted invincibility by a goddess in exchange for her devotion to that goddess. Let no man bed you, and you will be unbeatable. And that Red Sonja, not the character named Red Sonja from uh, one story by Robert E. Howard and not the, the idea of a female swords fighter from another story by Robert E. Howard, but rather this character, effectively created by Roy Thomas, took off. Fans love this character. Absolutely love this character. Made it into the big screen. I should make it into the big screen again, although uh, God knows that, that would not be an easy movie to watch in 2024, since as she has in the comic book, she would be wearing a shapeless potato sack instead of the infamous chainmail bikini. <laughs> and and uh, in ye olden days, in the 1980s, uh, Richard Tierney was, was uh, and his, and his co-writer were approached to write a series of Red Sonja novels. And his name actually came up in my emails just recently uh, from a trip last week that I did to a used bookstore with David Murphy, where I came back at, from that trip 
with a bunch of Cormac McCart novels by Andrew Ofut. Uh, and I, I read most of those. I think I've read all of those, the, the Cormac McCart, McCart novels that I found. I, I think I've read all of them before, but I'm going to, I'm really going to enjoy reading them again. And when I was making that haul in that video, I mentioned that I think Andrew Offit is the only person who's ever done pastiche fiction of Bran McMorn. And that, of course, isn't true. Of course that isn't true. That's ridiculous. I know better because Richard Cherney did a, a some great Bran McMorn pastiche fiction. And I just... Uh, some uh, Cormac McCart pastiche fiction that I just... He is all over the Conan world. And he agreed to do these with his co-writer. Uh, and this is exactly what I'm talking about when I say that old vintage mass market paperbacks are just going to get rarer and rarer. Not in terms of collectability, but in terms of you ever seeing them in a used bookstore. You're just not going to see them anymore. Time moves on. And it, 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 since these things aren't made anymore, they're just they're going to be harder and harder to spot. So I found this and grabbed it for Garbagas, but I also found almost all the others. I found the second one, Demon Knight, another Boris Vallejo cover, just terrific. Uh, I found the third one, When Hell Laughs, look at that, just incredible. <laughs> I found the fourth one, End Thor's Daughter. There's Red Sonia in a pensive mood, just sort of wondering what's going on. <laughs> I found number five, Against the Prince of Hell, just fantastic. I remember when these were coming out. I think I bought the first one when it came out. And then just thought nothing of it. And God knows where it is. Beagle probably ate it. And then number six, Star of Doom, where she faces uh, a sorcerer. And I think the, the irony here, the thing that bites just a little, is that I think there were only seven of these. I think I'm only mi now missing one. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that's true. I don't remember any other covers for this, but I think that that uh, that Richard did seven of these things, and they were done quickly, and they were done lots of fun, lots of boys. These are wonderfully boisterous novels. They are not Tolstoy, and I I am not I am not offending either of the authors to say so. I think they will be perfect for Garb August, especially since although there's Rocket Summer, there is no massive event in our little corner of booktube for fantasy. Which is a terrible shame. We need more booktube events. There aren't enough of them. <laughs> so, so those were all of the uh, mass market paperbacks on almost all the Red Sonia novels that there are. Almost. Uh, and then we can move on. Like, for instance, I found a Europa edition. This is from just a couple of years ago. Is that right? Uh, oh, no. It's from a long time ago. 2010. This is Jane Gardam, uh, who did Old Filth that I hauled on this channel just recently. This is God on the Rocks. A little coming-of-age and all of hers that I don't think I've ever read. It'll take an hour to do, I, uh, so I wasn't going to pass it up. Uh, then, what do we got here? You got some schmutz on your cover. This is by David Crouch, and it is a book about William Marshall. A thin biography. William Marshall has a, a one famous thin biography. This is not it. I think the subtitle of that one is called Flower of Chivalry. This one is called Court, Career, and Chivalry in the Angevin Empire, 1147 to 1219. That's a long time. And William Marshall was right at the heart of Angevin politics that whole time. He served a whole bunch of monarchs in the Plantagenet family who hated each other. They all managed to rely on him. That was a tricky thing to do. Uh, his story is fascinating. I wish that we had more information about it. There's one particular archive, one particular source that I really wish we had, that I, as far as I know, it has not come to light. It may be lost. Uh, I have that other, what's, some of you are going to know the book I'm talking about. It's not coming to my mind. I have the other one, though. I have the, the other thin William Marshall biography, the Shower, Flower of Chivalry or something like that. Uh, I have that here, but I'd never heard of this before. And it, it, it's, it's not that William Marshall is all that interesting. I, I don't think that he was. I don't I don't think that he was completely sentient. But studying his life gives you an incredible view of Henry II and Richard and John and Geoffrey and young Henry and Eleanor of Aquitaine. Gives you an incredible insight to all of them. Because he was their right-hand man, all of them, somehow. Even though they hated each other, they all relied on him. Uh, then I found, I found this thing. I can't believe it. Uh, 
this this is the author James Lee Milne. I I he's come up on this channel before. He's wrote wrote a whole bunch of weirdly unclassifiable books. Delightful. He's a delightful pro stylist. Uh, I don't just say that because of my beloved Edwardian era. <laughs> he was he was a delightful pro stylist, a really good raconteur, and always in all the stuff that I have found from him over the decades at the Brattle, I've always hoped that I'd find a really neat little paperback of his autobiography, which is has been praised to the skies in all kinds of writing that I have read. People have said, I read this and I read that, and oh, then there's Lee Milne's autobiography, which was hysterically funny. In fact, uh, yeah, Jeremy Lewis is blurbed on this edition as saying almost certainly the funniest autobiography ever written. I actually found it today. There's young Wilson on the cover right there. <laughs> and here you have, of course, the a ukulele. You cannot get away from this set without a ukulele. And this is a nice thing, thin with French flaps and everything. This is going to be a joy to read. I've only read it once, and that was from a library. Uh, then, speaking of only read once and from a library, very happy to have an edition of this work that I can actually just put on the shelf. This is William St. Clair, and this is his by far his most famous book, Lord Elgin and the Marbles about the Elgin Marbles. Not just about them, but about also the man in question. <laughs> so so this really works as a biography for people. Uh, but also a study, it's a study of uh, the procedures, I hate to use the word colonial, but I guess we have to, the colonial procedures for expropriating artwork from the tiniest little cameo to gigantic slabs of carved marble and bringing them to climate-controlled museums in the in the industrialized West, getting them out of Africa or Civil War torn Greece or wherever, and putting them in, in a museum where people can go and see them, rather than leaving them there to be choked and disfigured and chipped and graffitied and eroded by smog and car exhaust or whatnot. Uh, and of course, now this has become synonymous with the with the decades long. Uh, drive to get these things repatriated, to send them back to the Parthenon. And this book is a, another one of its strengths, in addition to how readable it is, is that it's also a, it spends a lot of time on what the Parthenon was to the ancient Greeks. So it's it's a feast of a book. I'm very, very, very happy uh, to find a copy. Uh, also, I was very happy to find a copy that was clean. A lot of time you find uh, Lord Elgin and the Marbles, and it's it's been heavily marked up. I don't know why that would be. Maybe it's taught in schools or was once upon a time. Oh, here, let's put all these mass markets back because we have a few bigger trade paperbacks and hardcovers. As we move slowly into dude bro territory and as we move towards what I think has to count as the find of the day. Uh, but first, we have a UK trade paperback. These I love these things. I love For some reason, I love the paper stock and the binding method and whatnot. This is by John Boyne. I have an, an on-again, off-again relationship with John Boyne. I didn't quite know what to make of Ladder in the Sky, uh, and I really like The Heart's Invisible Furious. I thought that was terrific. He's, I've read a couple of other books of his that have come to me, usually through Book Depository, the late lamented Book Depository, that didn't strike me as any good at all. And I don't mean a good author having an off day. I mean unpublishable and yet published. And this is one I have not read. Of course, John Boyne is most famous, I think, for The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. Uh, the Hearts and Visible Furies is a lot better than anything else I've read by this author, but I haven't read everything. And I've never read this. I, and it's a historical novel, and I, I would have grabbed it anyway, even if it weren't by John Boyne, for the sheer cheek of what he called it. This is a novel called Mutiny on the Bounty. <laughs> And it's about a, a cabin boy who, who takes service on the bounty. 14-year-old boy, John Jacob Turnstile, has got into trouble with the police on one too many occasions and is on his way to prison when an officer is put to him, when an offer is put to him. A ship has been refitted over the last few months and is about to set sail with an important mission. The boy who was expected to serve as the captain's personal valet has been injured and a replacement must be found immediately. The deal is struck, and Turnstile finds himself on board, meeting the captain just as the ship sets sail. The ship is the HMS Bounty, and the captain is William By Bly, and their destination is Tahiti. So this is, this is a historical novel about the mutiny on the bounty. And <laughs> John Boyne decided to call it the mutiny on the bounty. 
it's the, the nerve, the gall, the unmitigated cheek. It's I'm, uh, the first thing I thought when I realized what this was 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 to just quip, I can't wait to find a used copy of the author's other well-known book, Anna Karenina. <laughs> you can't call it something else. You have to call it Meet Me on the Bounty. I'm sorry, that's been done much better than you could do it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I haven't read it. I'd definitely give it a try. Then I found a nice big anthology. Oh my, how big is this? A thousand pages? Yeah, a thousand page anthology from uh, a long time ago. I want to say the 1920s because of the editor, because that's when the editor worked. Yeah, 1929. This is F.H. Uh, Pritzert's The World's Best Essays. Big, huge thing uh, that has so much in it. Oh my God. Uh, just everybody that you could think of, including lots and lots of names that I don't know. Bruno Dahlberg, Nicholas Beetz, C.B. Witt, Albert Werwey. Uh, it, it's broken down by subject, and there are by uh, country, and there are a lot of names in here that I don't know. There are a lot of names that I do, and even the names that I do know, uh, there are essays in here by them that I don't know. This is, this is the essay taste of an entirely different generation. So it won't be predictable in the way that a thousand-page essay collection would be today. I love these sorts of things. I don't ever, I usually don't ever read them front to back. Instead, I will put a bookmark in this and pop all around it and see. Uh, I have a complete face in, the, in this editor. We will just see. Uh, okay, then a couple of blasts of dude, bro. Uh, I mentioned and I have demonstrated a couple of times that the Brattle recently f uh, bought a library that included a lot of old Avenal omnibus hardcover volumes where you take take one particular author and fill a hardcover with a bunch of their work, commission a cheesy cover illustration, and then you're off to the races. Uh, Avenal doesn't do that anymore. I don't think even Fall River does that anymore. I don't think anybody makes books like that anymore. Uh, they'd be straight to remainder houses if they did. But I, I have a sweet tooth for those Avenal volumes. I really like them. And I get them whenever I can, and they suit my needs. Of course, there are some that I really wish I could find that I'd never see, ever. I never see a Miss Marple. I never see Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Uh, I saw Once Upon a Time an Edgar Rice Burroughs volume. I had it for a while and then got rid of it. i uh, never see that again. Uh, but just recently, the Brattle got a whole bunch of them, and they have been making their way into the sale lot in bits and pieces. And I found two today. They were it's just it's just a joke on my part. It was not intentional that they're dude bro. There was plenty of other stuff there. But the two that I found today are uh quite dude bro. <laughs> the first is John McDonald. These are uh Travis McGee novels. Uh we have here The Dreadful Lemon Sky, The Empty Copper Sea, Free Fall in Crimson, The Green Ripper, and of course one of his most famous ones, The Tan and Sandy Silence. Uh, some of these I have read. I have not been a worshipper of John McDonald. I've not been a worshipper of Travis McGee. He is quintessential dude bro in that I don't think a woman has ever read a Travis McGee novel. <laughs> not, in, not in all this time. Not in 60, 70 years of them being in print. I don't think a woman has ever read them. And if you read one, anyone, you can see why. <laughs> because women in these books are basically cocker spaniels. Uh, which it, it, you're supposed to sit back and stoically admire the fact that Travis McGee doesn't like to see a Cocker Spaniel mistreated. And he's going to be really kind. I've got a lot on my mind. I Certainly no one could criticize me if I belted you for no reason. but Because I've, I've got a lot on my mind. You don't have a mind, so you don't know what that's like. I have a lot on my mind. But even so, even given that, I'm going to be gentle with you. And for that, I expect the applause of the gallery. Just unridiculous, just ridiculous industrial strength sexism. <laughs> but uh, I just read a Travis McGee for for March Mystery Madness. I just read uh, Gray is the Color of Regret or something like that. There's always a color in one of his titles, uh, and so I saw this I, when I was reading that book. I realized I don't have any Travis McGee in actual paper and print format. So when I saw this for a dollar, I grabbed it, uh, and the other. The other omnibus edition that I found today also just happens to be Dude Bro, where, once again, you have one-dimensional... We're calling the female characters in these books one-dimensional. would be an insult to spatial dynamics. <laughs> this is Alistair MacLean, 
who a lot of you will know from uh, When Eagles Dare or Ice Station Zebra or whatnot. And uh, I found an, a, a, a big brick of a book of his uh, with Richard Burton on the cover. How do you like that? <laughs> what a great cover there. So we don't have, we don't have a, a cheesy illustration. Instead, in a rare instance for one of these Avenal omnibus volumes, we have a photograph. So this has Where Eagles Dare, HMS Ulysses, Ice Station Zebra, When Eight Bells Toll, and The Guns of Navarone. So basically, I mean, Where Eagles Dare, HMS Ulysses, Ice Station Zebra, and The Guns of Navarone are the books that this author is most famous for. And here they are all in one book. That's I, I love these Avenal volumes for that reason. Uh, and th So that was a blast of dude, bro. And then I found, I found a cheesy old classic from... I should know the date. Is this the 1960s? It must be. Oh, 1972. Okay. I love this book. I don't know how many copies I've had. I go through them. I haven't seen one in a while. I grabbed this one, even though it's not in the best of shape, because I like having it. It just is a source of... It's a comfort blanket for me. Uh, of Once Upon a Time, it being the sum total of knowledge. It's now so ridiculously outdated. But it doesn't matter, because it's an, it was an, a labor of love. This is life before man with his killer cover. It's slightly oversized. And you can see that the, the ambit goes here from uh, the billions of years when the only life on Earth was single-celled organisms, was scum. Billions of years for that, that that was true. Where this was a planet that had life, but not even multicellular life, much less chordate life. Not even close to that. Just scum in the water. Uh but it takes you from there, you can tell from the back cover, it takes you from there right to the doorstep of man. Maybe technically before man, but not much before man. <laughs> and it's all, the illustrations are by Z. Burian, and the text is by Z. Spinar. So we got a lot of Zs going on there, but this is the kind of artwork that I'm talking about. And it's all through this thing. Look at this. Look at those Spinosaurus. Oh my god. <laughs> it's all through this volume. Just... Uh, let's let's get to uh, there's Quetzalcoatl or rather our Archaeopteryx. Look at that, huh? All these were all oh yeah. See, this is what I mean. This is that this thing doesn't live in a swamp. <laughs> this it's it, there's outdated stuff going on here. Outdated conceptions of what these things were like. Uh, but still amazing. These these kinds of pictures. Look at that. Look at that shovel mouth. These kinds of pictures inflame the imagination of an entire generation of uh, paleontologists, of, of archaeologists. Just a whole generation of them grew up on pictures like this. Uh, and I loved this book. Oh, my God. I, I, the last copy that I had, I read until it fell apart. Didn't send it to anybody. I just, I would never do that. I just, I read it until I, this is, it's older. In other words, scientists today would reconstitute these animals very differently. And they would say a lot of different things about where they lived and how they lived, whether or not they were warm-blooded, uh, whether or not they were communal, uh, whether or not they were capable of altruism. And that's to say nothing of uh, the end of the book. The, the end, <laughs> look at that. There's Primitive Man fighting a flat-faced bear. Oh, needless to say, a lot of the details here have been superseded by later research. But I don't... This was such a labor of love that I don't really mind. I don't really mind at all. I conjure with these pictures every bit as much as I do with the latest research that oh, that overturns a lot of these pictures. So um, I was overjoyed to find a copy. Even though it's it's in rough shape, I'll be careful with it. And then the last thing uh, certainly counts as the find of the day and is in direct car correspondence with the previous Brattle trip that I had. Last time I went to the Brattle trip, uh, to, to the Brattle, all those days and days ago, I found a bunch of old Tarzan comic books uh, by Joe Kubert. Artwork and writing by Joe Kubert, also covers by Joe Kubert, the great artist and writer Joe Kubert, who is synonymous with Tarzan. Uh, the hipster fans out there, the dude bro fans out there will say, oh, I think he's synonymous with Hawkman. No. Shut your pie hole. He's synonymous with Tarzan. Uh, and I found a whole bunch of back issues of a dollar a piece. I got them. I've been loving them. Uh, but at the time when I made that video, I bellyached, where is the volume? Where is the collected volume 
of Joe Schubert's run on Tarzan. And I was watching with Michael K. Vaughn, who's our expert on all things uh, ERB, and he said that such a volume did exist. And that there were also, he reminded me that there were hardcovers, little hardcovers, thin hardcovers that were done. And I remember those being in the bookstore. I remember those being in my local comic shop eons ago. And they were expensive. They were pricey. And I told the comic shop uh, uh, owner, well, why would I bother to get these when the back issues of these are so readily available? Little did I guess that the back issues would stop being available. Of course, I should have seen that. But what did I find today? That volume. <laughs> that Dark Horse volume of the complete Joe Kubert Tarzan collection in color. This is, this is exactly the thing. I, I bought a lot of these issues <laughs> just the, uh, just the other day at the Brattle. I bought a lot of these issues only they weren't, they're still, they're in crumbling newsprint. They're not in these, these glossy pages that will hold up. Uh, and this also has, uh, original sketch pages and, uh, breakdowns of what those things were like. Just, <laughs> just it also has the covers that I was that I was moaning about. I don't think uh, that this volume. I don't think that this volume contains. Uh, oh no, it doesn't seem to have covers at all for the later issues. Let's take a look and see. Uh, no, not really. Uh, Okay, well, I'll have to look through this. It doesn't look like all of the covers are included, and certainly the covers that Joe Kubert did when he wasn't doing the interior artwork are not included here. And that is still the greatest Tarzan artist of them all, drawing Tarzan in full color. Those covers should be preserved. A big, uh, nice paperback like this of all of Joe Kubert's artwork, especially all of his covers, that would be really nice. Although not all of his covers are worth writing home about. Right? He did some for some for like All Star Squadron or whatever that are really bad. But his Tarzan covers are all brilliant. They uh, and here is that volume, just unbelievable. A perfect example of the Brattle will provide, where I no sooner identify in myself a need for something than the Brattle turns it up. This was not on the shelf the other day when I was when I was combing everywhere for Tarzan stuff. This wasn't there. It was today. That's the, the brattle in a nutshell, is that you absolutely never know what you're going to find. And it can be something that you really, really want. I, I was daydreaming about exactly something like this. I only vaguely remember that I ever saw this when it was out in bookstores. Here it is. The complete Joe Kubert Tarzan in color in a nice, big, heavy hardcover. Okay, great. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, so, so that was my brattle haul. Way too much to make a Steve Pyramid just... I, I did this because rain is coming, <laughs> because it looks like it's going to rain tomorrow, and maybe a strong chance of rain uh, all week long. And I didn't want to run out of books, <laughs> so, so I got a ton of science fiction, a ton of Red Sonja. How wonderful! <laughs> the the uh, Tierney does such a heartfelt job on his Lovecraft writing, his Robert E. Howard writing. I seem to remember these Red Sonja books are the same way. Uh, started out in Iowa, totally creative, totally wide-eyed and bright-skied, and then fell on hard times and moved to Minnesota. Or was it Wisconsin? One of those wolf-haunted northern states where you know you're in trouble. Uh, but anyway, a fine, fine trip to the Brattle. Of course, I will not be going back to the Brattle for a good long time. I have more books than I need. <laughs> so we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to wrap this up for now, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.